Well, I probably don't need to tell you that today is Palm Sunday, so called because of the palm branches which the crowds cut down and scattered across the path of the colt that Christ was riding upon as he rode into Jerusalem in the event that we call the triumphal entry. It was a time when Jesus was widely acclaimed as the promised Messiah, a time when he was publicly acclaimed as the Jewish king and rightful heir to David's throne. But ironically, as you know, he was crucified within five days of this event. And it is, un, it is very likely that some of the very ones who were shouting his hosannas on Palm Sunday were also crying out, crucify him, crucify him, just a few days later. Evidently, some of them changed their minds. And far from acknowledging Jesus Christ as their king and promised Messiah, they decided that he was not even worthy to live. But as we know, they were wrong. They were absolutely and 100% wrong. And Peter has been dealing with a very similar event in first, or Second Peter, rather, chapter 1, as we have been pursuing our, our series through that book of the Bible. And you recall that the transfiguration, as witnessed by Peter and the other apostles, and as testified to by Peter in this epistle, was an event that revealed the divine glory of Christ. He is Lord. He is King. He is the promised Messiah. In fact, as Peter tells us here, the transfiguration anticipates the second coming of Christ. For in all three of the synoptic accounts that record for us the event of the transfiguration, it is preceded by the promise that some of the disciples will not see death until they have seen Christ coming in the glory of his kingdom. And then immediately after that announcement, we have the event of the transfiguration. And so God the Holy Spirit has linked together the transfiguration with the second coming of Christ. And the glory and the honor which the multitudes wanted to see immediately in their day is actually going to be displayed universally when our Lord comes the second time. In the meantime, we must trust in the certainty of his revelation. And so the eyewitness experience, as told to us by Peter and other apostles, testify to the glory which they saw, which we have not yet seen, but we believe that it is there because they have told us. And beyond that, the scriptures, the prophets of God, men designated by God to give his word to men, those prophets and the scriptures have testified of Christ's glorious coming kingdom. And we are anticipating that because we believe the word of God. If we are wise, we will heed this testimony. And so we come to Second Peter 1 verse 19. And Peter writes, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Here is a text about the sure word of God. Here is a verse that tells us that God's word is the believer's infallible guide in this dark world. And we can divide the text, I think, into three parts. Number one, a more sure word. Number two, a light in darkness. And number three, a new day dawning. First of all, a more sure word, the first part of verse 19, tells us, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed. The phrase that our translators, my translator, the translators of the New King James Bible, uh, translated in the way that I just rendered to you, has been variously translated by different translators because the word, the key word that in my Bible is translated confirmed, is actually subject to a couple of different, maybe even three different renderings, all of them accurate according to the Greek. The old King James said, we have a more sure word of prophecy. 
And literally, this phrase under scrutiny at the moment is, we have more sure the prophetic word. We have more sure the prophetic word. And the question is, what does that mean exactly? Does it mean, as the New King James says, we have the prophetic word confirmed? Is that what Peter means when he says we have more sure the prophetic word? Or, as in the old King James, we have a more sure word of prophecy. Is that what Peter is getting at? We'll look at that more closely in a moment, but I want you to ponder that for a second. I also want to make note of the fact that Peter, again, uses the plural personal pronoun we rather than the singular I that he has used in the earlier parts of the chapter. And here he probably has shifted his focus from himself and the other apostles, the we of the preceding verse, the immediately preceding verse, when he says, we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. But probably he is shifting now his focus to himself and his readers. When he says in verse 19, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed. And you can see how his focus is now shifting from the apostles to his readers. And it seems, therefore, that he is embracing himself and his readers together when he says, we have the sure prophetic word. We have more sure the prophetic word. Now, as I said, there's two ways, possibly even three, to translate this phrase. Does it mean a more sure word? That is, the scriptures are more sure even than the eyewitness account of the transfiguration which Peter and the apostles saw. The scriptures more sure even than experience. We have a more sure word of prophecy, or we have a more sure word even prophecy. Or is Peter saying that the word, the prophetic word, has been made more sure by the transfiguration? The scriptures have been confirmed by what Peter and the others saw on the Holy Mount. If that is what Peter has in mind, then evidently he's thinking primarily about the Old Testament scriptures, and he has a sequence in mind. We have had the Old Testament scriptures which told us of a coming king told us of a coming kingdom when God would send his Messiah and that Messiah would sit upon David's throne and a kingdom would be ushered in. And we have believed that because the Old Testament prophets told us, but we have something else that has now confirmed it. We have been on the holy mountain. We have seen Jesus transfigured before our eyes. That identifies to us the certainty that Jesus is the one that the Old Testament prophets spoke about. And now we have the Old Testament prophecies confirmed even more securely than they were before. So the question in the translation is, what is the confirming item? Is it the transfiguration that confirms the scriptures? Or is it the prophetic word that confirms the transfiguration? Has the transfiguration that Peter and the prophets of the apostles saw confirmed the prophecies? And I will say that the majority of commentators take it in that light, but not all of them. In fact, one who is considered in many ways to be the most scholarly, I think, of all the modern commentators on Second Peter, Richard Baucom, says this. He says, most scholars take the event as confirming scripture, which is not a very natural meaning in the Greek. So it can mean that, but he says that's not the most obvious meaning, not the most natural meaning. That's his opinion on the subject. So is it the transfiguration that is a confirming item, or is it the prophetic word of God that becomes the ultimate confirming item? The scriptures are more sure even than the eyewitness event which Peter and the others saw. In other words, visions, as important as they may be, this one was certainly important. It wasn't exactly a vision, but this kind of supernatural event, which Peter and James and John were allowed to see, as important as they are, are not as important as the Word of God. Events like this are unverifiable, except by the ones 
who immediately witnessed them. Everyone else has to take their word for it. And they're generally unrepeatable. Uh, Peter never had an event like this again in his life. And most people who, who have claimed to have experiences like this are not able to repeat them. And so is it the scriptures that take precedence over this kind of supernatural event? Or is this event the confirming factor of scripture? There is a third possibility, and maybe this will get us off the horns of the dilemma. Richard Bauckham, that I quoted a moment ago, who is considered to be probably the greatest technical scholar on this book, says that probably neither one of these options is actually in view. (coughs) That this phrase can be translated in such a way that no comparison is required. Both the other translations assume a comparison. Something is more sure. Either the Word of God is made more sure by the transfiguration, a comparison of the transfiguration to the Scriptures, and the transfiguration uh, comes out in, on top in that comparison. Or the Scriptures are superior to the transfiguration. They're compared together, and the Scriptures are considered to be superior to the transfiguration. But he says there is a third option. And this phrase can be translated. We have the prophetic word, very firm. It doesn't have to be translated, made more sure, to involve a comparison between these two events and then figuring out which one is considered to be the superior event. But it can be translated in a way that does not imply a comparison at all. We have the prophetic word, very firm. In other words, a sequence. We have the eyewitness account. We also have the prophetic word. In other words, two very reliable witnesses to the same truth. Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is King. Jesus Christ is God. Jesus Christ is coming again. And the Bible tells us that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And God has supplied us with two witnesses in this case. Number one, the transfiguration attested to by eyewitnesses to us. That witnesses to who Christ is. Number two, the prophetic scriptures. They also testify to us as to who Jesus Christ is. But that also brings us to look a little more carefully at the question of what is the prophetic word that is in view. And so we have the prophetic word. And what does Peter mean by the prophetic word? Most think that he is thinking about, he is visualizing in that statement, the Old Testament scriptures. The Old Testament scriptures were the scriptures in Peter's day, no question about it. And for quite a bit beyond that, during that time when the New Testament scriptures were being written and being circulated and being collected and being recognized in the canon of 27 books that we have today, and that took some time. And so while all that was going on, there was a body of writings, that's what the word scripture means, the writings, There was a body of writings that was recognized as Scripture by all the Jews and by all the Christians. And that, of course, was what we call the Old Testament. They would have probably called it the Hebrew Scriptures. Some think that Peter is even narrowing this body of truth down a little bit more. And he doesn't have all the Old Testament scriptures in mind, but he is particularly thinking about those that foretell the coming of Christ and his glory. And he's saying, we not only have the prophecies about Christ's coming, we have the prophetic word, but we also have the eyewitness account, which has been revealed to us as well. But I think it is a mistake to limit ourselves to the Old Testament and what Peter is describing here, because I think there are indications in the text itself that Peter is already beginning to think in terms of the New Testament scriptures, which admittedly are just now being written, but nevertheless are even now in the process of being written. This epistle being one of them, one of the books of the New Testament, 
scriptures. Remember, Peter's already alluded to that in verse 15. When he said, moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. I am going to work very hard to be sure that you have a reminder, a record of these things after my death, after my exodus, something that you can go back to again and again and again and again. And what can that be except Peter's epistle? And what can Peter be saying about that epistle except that it's going to enjoy divine preservation? It is going to be preserved by God so that it will always be available to the people of God. And therefore, what can he have in mind except the beginning of the New Testament, the New Covenant Scriptures that even he and others are beginning to produce as, as being supervised by the Holy Spirit of God? And furthermore, before Second Peter is over, he makes an allusion to Paul's contribution to the New Testament Scriptures, an enormous contribution, as we know. Paul, who wrote nearly half of all the books in the New Testament, and remember what Peter says in chapter 3, in verses 15 and 16, as he's closing out this epistle. He said, And consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. So Paul is identified. Paul has written. Paul's writings were known to Peter's readers. We don't know which epistles they had, but they had one or more of Paul's epistles. Uh, Paul has written to you, verse 16, as also in all his epistles, plural, a reference to a collection of epistles written by Paul, already known to Peter and to his readers in that day. And what else does he say about them? In which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also, notice this, the rest of the Scriptures. Peter's already talking about New Testament Scriptures. He's already talking about his own writings and the writings of Paul, two of the apostles. He's already comparing Paul's writings to the Old Testament Scriptures, the body of of truth that everyone would have acknowledged as Scripture. And he's already comparing Paul's writings to that. And he's saying some people who are unstable, who are foolish, who are unbelievers, they pick apart Paul's epistles just like they disbelieve and pick apart and criticize the Old Testament Scriptures. But they're foolish in doing that. And so I take it, therefore, that when Peter, in verse 19, is talking about the prophetic word, he's talking about the Scriptures, all of them, even though some of them had not been written yet, but all of them that had been written, all of them that were even now being produced. He was actually in the very process of producing this epistle that we call Second Peter. It was about one-third produced when he penned these words, and there's some more to go. And I think he had in mind the other New Testament scriptures, which even yet were going to be produced through human instruments by the Spirit of God. When he talks about the prophetic word, he's talking about the word of prophets. And I think it's clear, not prophets in the sense of foretelling the future, but prophets in the sense that these are men to whom God gave divine revelation. He's basically saying the same thing that Paul says in his great doxology at the end of the book of, at the end of, the book of Romans. Romans chapter 16, verses 25 through 27. Listen to this. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began but now made manifest, and by the prophetic scriptures, notice that phrase, prophetic scriptures, what is Paul talking about? Is he talking about the writings that foretell the future? No, not really, though that's included, but it's something bigger than that. And by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations. And what has been made known to all nations? 
The gospel, the mystery of the revelation of Jesus Christ in verse 25. Made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith. To God alone wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. So when we talk about the prophecy, our minds usually think foretelling the future. That's what prophecy is. But I think more often in the first century, their minds would have thought divine revelation that God has entrusted to carefully selected men that he has supervised and given his word to and through. In other words, prophetic word is really a synonym for scriptures. And so we have the prophetic word. A sure thing. The prophetic word. What did we say? We have the, uh, what was the third way to to, uh, translate it? We have the prophetic word very firm. We have the scriptures very firm is what Peter is saying here. And so having said all of that, trying to work through this dilemma of, of which way to translate this phrase and getting down to what Peter is emphasizing here, what is the bottom line in it all? Well, anyway, you take it, it's clear that Peter is strongly emphasizing The scriptures, the word of God, the writings, the sacred writings, the book we call the Bible. And he wants his readers to have confidence in the reliability of scripture. He is telling them and us that the Bible should be the main focus of our attention and that the Bible should be the main source of our guidance in this world. Whether that phrase should be understood as the scriptures being a more sure witness than the transfiguration or not. Ultimately, that is what Peter is saying. He is telling us about the superiority of scripture. The vision, the the event, the transfiguration, that's over and done with. Peter saw it, James saw it, John saw it. Peter and John could still testify about it at the day that Peter wrote. James had already been executed by Herod in Acts chapter 12, as we know. But Peter and John could still testify to what they have seen. Now they're dead. Nobody can testify to it except in the Scriptures. The Scriptures testify to that event. If God has given us a body of writings that is His Word, committed to us through men, but supervised by His Holy Spirit, and therefore inerrant and infallible, preserved for us today, then in that is the testimony we need. We're dependent upon the Scriptures for the testimony of the Transfiguration. We're dependent upon the Scriptures for everything we know for sure about God, about salvation, about heaven, about hell, about the coming of Christ, about the coming kingdom. We're dependent upon the Scriptures for all of that. The Scriptures are the thing that receives the highest commendation and the highest attention and emphasis in all of this. Reminds me of what Christ said in the account of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke chapter 16. You remember that the rich man wanted Abraham to send somebody back to his brothers to warn them not to come to that place of torment. And here's what Abraham said, and Abraham is speaking here as a spokesman for God. He was a prophet of God. And Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. The rich man said, please send somebody back from the dead to testify to my brothers. Abraham says, they have Moses and the prophets, they have the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, let them hear them. And he, that is the rich man, said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. They won't pay any attention to Moses and the prophets. How did he know that? Well, because he knew them. He knew that they hadn't been paying any attention to them all along. He knew that he hadn't been paying attention to them. And he knew that they, so far, hadn't paid any attention to Moses and the prophets. No, Father Abraham, but if, but if one rises from the dead, they will repent. 
But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, the one rise from the dead. Well, a miracle, like somebody that they know who is dead, rising from the dead and coming to them and speaking to them, will that do the job? Will that persuade them to believe if the Scriptures themselves do not persuade them to believe? The rich man said, yes, because he was not very insightful. He was not a spiritually minded man. He did not have spiritual understanding. He was, he was very immature and defective in his understanding of spiritual truth. The rich man said, yes, that's, that'll do it. That'll do it every time. And God said, no, that won't do it. If they won't hear the scriptures, they won't believe no matter what they do. What, what I do, what others do, no matter what visions, what miracles, what supernatural events they experience. If they won't believe the scriptures, they won't believe anything else. A more sure word is the word of God we call the Bible. But that brings us to the middle part of our verse, which I have called a light in darkness. And you can see why, because Peter goes on to say, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place. A dark place. The word dark means dry, parched. Dirty, murky, a dark place. It refers to the murky blackness of this fallen world and its sinful and cursed condition. It's talking about a place where people have no sure guidance. They are stumbling about in spiritual darkness. They don't understand. And beyond the environment, the world in which we live, it's also talking about men's own sinful hearts, which are likewise black and darkened. Notice what Paul says in Ephesians 4, 17 and 18. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened being alienated from the life of God because of ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. Their understanding is dark. They're in a dark place, and there's darkness within. Darkness within, darkness without. But the new birth is light shining in a dark place. It's light shining in the dark place of our souls and light shining in the darkness of this world. Paul said in Ephesians 5, 8, But you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Conversion is passing out of darkness into light, out of blindness into sight, out of confusion into clarity, out of inability to understand God and things eternal into finally understanding these things by the illuminating light of God through his word and by his spirit that has shined into our souls. No wonder we sang earlier, I have come from the darkness to the light of the Lord. I've come from the darkness to the day. He's guided my footsteps in the light of his word. By his love, he has shown me the way. I've come from the darkness to the light. That's exactly what's being described here. That's even what Peter said in his first epistle, chapter 2, verse 9. He said, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him, what? Who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I can't think of a better description of salvation. God who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. God who transferred us out of darkness into light. God who brought us out of that state of darkness into marvelous light. And so that's the dark place. But what is the illuminating object in that dark place? Back to our text. This prophetic word, which you do well to heed as a light 
that shines in a dark place. What is the light? Well, the light is obviously the Word of God. The whole context tells us that. And we all know verses that talk very much the same. How many of you have memorized Psalm 119, verse 105? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I even remember singing a song about that when I was a boy. Just taking the words right out of that psalm. Thy word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path always. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. I'm, that I might not sin, that I might not sin. Thy word have I hid in my heart. Psalm 119. The word of God is a light in a dark place. Now, Paul quoted another text from the Old Testament in Ephesians 5.14. When he said, therefore, he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. And Christ indeed does does give us light, the light of salvation, the light of his spirit, the light of his word, the Bible. That is the light, the word of God, a light, a lamp, a light, a torch. The, The picture here is of an oil lamp that a person in that day would have in his home after dark to to shed some light in the house. He might have a number of these oil lamps or even an oil torch that he might take outside to lighten his path on a dark night. No headlights, no street lights, no porch lights in that day, but they had these oil lights which they could use. And Peter says the Word of God is like that. It's a light, a lamp. In a dark place. And therefore, what's the wise course of action in regard to the Word of God? Peter says, if you're you're wise, you will heed it. You'll pay attention to it. We have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place. You do well to heed it, to pay close attention to it. Why? Because it turns out that the Bible, God's Word, is the only sure guide in this sin-darkened world. It alone is able to penetrate the darkness, the darkness of sin, the darkness of ignorance, the darkness of unbelief, the darkness of rebellion against the God who created this universe, the God who gave us His Word. There's only one thing that's able to penetrate that darkness, and that is the Bible, the Word of God itself. That is able to shine a light in a dark place that is able to guide us so that we can walk surely and not stumble in this dark world. Those who don't have the light of God's word or those who will not utilize the light of God's word are destined to stumble, to falter, to be confused, to wander around, to not know what to do. Sometimes we shake our heads in wonderment at the various solutions that are proposed to to help our nation get out of the obvious many problems that it is in. And it seems like the wisest people, the most educated people, the smartest people, we're told, in the world propose solutions, and they only turn out to be more problematic than what we had before. How come they are so unable to understand the truth? Some say they're doing that deliberately. I don't think so, necessarily. They just don't understand. They don't have a guide. They don't have light. They have the world's substitute for life. They have the world's education. They have, they have the world's wisdom. But the world's wisdom turns out to be darkness, not light. But we have light. If we're wise, we'll heed it. If we're foolish, we'll ignore it. And so that brings us to the third phrase in our text, which is, a new day is dawning. This light shines in a dark place until something happens. The last part of verse 19, until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. Until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. Until the day dawns. What day is that? Let me read Paul again in Romans 13, verses 11 and 12. And do this knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is in hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. 
The night is far spent. The day is at hand. What day is that? Well, let's listen to the testimony of the writer of Hebrews in chapter 10, verse 25. A very familiar verse. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. The day. The day. The day. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Don't fail to to minister to one another in the body of Christ. Don't fail to work hard at building connections in the body of Christ so that you can minister to one another and edify one another. This is vitally important. Don't be disobedient. Don't be foolish. Don't, Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Don't drop out of church. Why? Because the day is coming. What day is that? It's obviously the day of Christ's return. If there's any question about that, we only need to look at the next little word, the morning star. Again, back to verse 19. The light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the morning star arise. That'll seal it. What is the morning star? The Greek word phosphoros. Does that sound like an English word? Phosphorus. Very. That comes from that word. Phos for us, it means light bringer. Light bringer, morning star. That was the Greek name for the planet Venus. Some of you will know that Venus is known as the morning star. You say it's not a star, it's a planet. I know, but it's known as the morning star. Because it is the star that you see on a little bit above the horizon before the dawn arrives. It, it, it signals the coming of the dawn. That's the planetary signal of the coming of the dawn. Before you can see the sunlight, Venus is already reflecting that sunlight back to the earth. And it looks like a star. Unless you happen to know that it's a planet reflecting light rather than a star that is radiating light, you might not know that, but it is. It's a very bright star. It's like our moon, but much farther away and much smaller. But it it is reflecting the light of the sun in the early morning before the dawn. It is called the morning star, Venus. That's one way that the Greeks used this word, phosphoros. To them, that meant Venus, the morning star. But they also used it to refer to royal personages and even their various deities, their pagan gods, which, of course, were no gods at all. But they would refer to them by this phrase, the morning star. And this is the phrase that Peter connects with the day that is approaching. You better heed the word of God is a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises. Peter, no doubt, was thinking about the prophets, the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament text in Numbers 24, 17, a prophecy in the middle of a longer prophecy by Balaam. And right in the middle of what he says, we read these words in Numbers 24, 17. A star shall come out of Jacob, a scepter shall arise out of Israel. A star shall come out of David, a scepter shall arise out of Israel. What's that referring to? Well, it's referring to the coming king, the coming Messiah. A scepter refers to a king. A scepter shall arise out of Israel, but it's also referred to as a star that shall come out of Jacob. We can go all the way to the end of our Bible, to Revelation 22, 16, and hear the words of Christ himself when he says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you of these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David. He's claiming to be the one that the Old Testament prophets spoke of. He's claiming to be the one who is the rightful heir to David's throne. He's claiming to be the one who has the scepter to rule as a king on the throne of Israel. He's claiming to be all of that. I am the root and the offspring of David. What else? The bright and morning star. There it is. Ties it all together. From Old Testament to New Testament, the morning star is none other than Christ himself. But the question arises in some minds, therefore, why does Peter refer 
to this event taking place in our hearts. The prophetic word which you do well to heed is a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. The coming of Christ doesn't take place in our hearts. That almost sounds like a a liberal way of of denying the literal coming of Jesus Christ. It's It's not a physical, visible, literal coming. Christ comes in your hearts. Christ didn't literally rise from the grave. Christ arose in your hearts when you believed on Him. Christ isn't literally going to come again. Christ comes to your hearts whenever you believe on Him. That sounds like the language of the skeptics and the deniers. Why is Peter using this kind of language in this text of the coming of Christ when he says, until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts? Well, Peter is talking, remember, about the scriptures, and we will need the scriptures until something takes place. Remember, get it all in sequence. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. He's telling us that the second coming of Christ, the Perusia, will be the full revelation of God. The scriptures, as important as they are to us now, are still not the full revelation. The full revelation is Christ himself when he comes. The knowledge that shines in our hearts at conversion will reach its full consummation at the second coming. Now you can see why he's talking about our hearts, because he's talking about what has taken place within us in the new birth, what has taken place within us as the light of the gospel has shined in our souls, what takes place in our hearts as we trust the word, believe the word, hold on to the word. We are doing that with what the Bible calls our hearts. That is our inner man. It involves our mind, our soul, our spirit, our being. A lot of different ways that we try to describe this, but it is in our hearts. And what Peter is telling us is that we must cling to the word of God until Christ comes. And when he comes, we won't need the Bible anymore. Now, your reaction is kind of like mine was when I thought about that. I thought, wait a minute, I don't like that. I've grown to love the Bible. I I, I don't want to let loose of it ever. And you're telling me that Peter is saying that the Word of God is only until Christ comes? Let's uh, ask another apostle, Apostle Paul, once again to speak to this issue as he does in 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 10. Love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Prophecies? You who? <laughs> prophecies? Yeah, they will fail. In other words, the time will come when God is not going to give supernatural revelation to men as he did to the prophets in the Old Testament and even in the early part of the first century. But that's going to come to an end. Whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. That comes to an end too, I think about the same time, first century. Uh, Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. That is supernatural knowledge. There was this this spiritual gift of knowledge where God gave supernatural knowledge to men in that day to understand things that had not yet been committed to Scripture because the New Testament had not yet been written. And so there was the ministry of a word of knowledge in those first century churches, but that will all pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. Now, many think that the perfect thing that comes is the Bible, the Word of God, and it may be. I'm not going to get dogmatic about the interpretation of that verse, but it may very well be the coming of Christ that Peter is referring to here, but this much is clear. When the day dawns, we don't still need the lamp. We've got something that's better and brighter, don't we? When sunlight is flooding into your bedroom, you throw back the curtains and turn off the lamp. And save the electricity. You've got something that's better. You've got better light than the lamp that you were using to see in the darkness. Or maybe I could put it to you this way. 
Some of you may have been in the situation where your beloved was separated from you for a long time. Back in the old days, you would have written letters back and forth. Now you probably email back and forth. It's not quite as romantic as to get that letter in the, in the uh, uh, mailbox, longing for it, waiting for it. It comes, you smell it, you sniff it before you open it. Some, some of you young people don't have a clue what I'm talking about. That's a shame. Things have really changed. But, but uh, this wonderful letter... You open it, you read it, you cherish it, you read it again, you cherish it, you read it again, you hold on to it. That's, that's, that reminds you of your beloved. That's, that's, a, that's the closest thing you've got to it right then. And then your beloved comes home and you are together. And I don't think you sit around cherishing that letter. You're not holding, hugging that letter to your, to your chest anymore. The letter goes in the drawer. It's not that you dishonor it. It's not you still are happy for it. Maybe when your beloved dies, you'll go back and pull out those letters and read them again because now you've been separated again. And so that written reminder is very important to you again. But when you've got your beloved with you, the letters, as wonderful as they were, fade into lesser significance, almost insignificance by comparison. And that's what Peter's telling us. When the Lord Jesus Christ returns, we'll be in his presence. His presence will be so great, so wonderful, so glorious. The light of his presence will be such a superior light, even to the scriptures, which we can only understand partially, that we won't need the scriptures anymore. It's not that we'll dishonor them. It's not that that we won't uh, think about them, that we won't be thankful for them. It may be that we'll even open them and say, help me understand this part that I had trouble with when I was down upon the earth. Or maybe it'll all be clear instantaneously. Maybe we won't need that kind of help. But the fact of the matter is, when Christ comes, then we won't need the Scriptures. We won't need the lamp that shines in a dark place because there won't be any dark place. It's all going to be light then. There will be no need of the sun or the moon, Revelation tells us. For the Lamb is the light. The light is glorious, brilliant, all penetrating. A glorious light that outshines the sun. But until then, and that day could come at any time, the way Peter writes here, he, he, he writes as if his, his readers could be alive when the Perusia, Perusia occurs. That day could come at any time. It could happen today. But until it does, this is what we need. This is what we better hold on to. This is what we better learn. This is what we better value. This is what we better treasure. This is what we better look to as our guide because it is the only sure guide in the darkness of this world. We don't need visions to know the truth. But we are in a dark world and we do need something. But God has provided the very best thing next to his son, next to the glorious king in our presence or we in his presence. That's the only thing. That's the only thing that's better than the Bible. And so until the day dawns, the day comes. And the morning star arises in your hearts. You better give careful attention to the lamp of Scripture. You better follow its guidance. You better heed its warnings. You better listen to its reproofs. You better be strengthened by its encouragements. When you do, you will walk safely in this dark world. If you neglect the Bible, then you will become engulfed in darkness. Shall we pray? We thank you, Lord, for giving us your word. We thank you, Lord, for giving us your spirit to open our hearts, to shine the truth of your word into the darkness of our souls. We thank you, Lord, for giving us the guidance that we need, the book called the Bible, and the indwelling Holy Spirit to enable us to understand your word so that it might guide us. We thank you for this. And we value your word. We treasure the Bible. 
And we look forward to that day when Jesus Christ returns. And we shall be so caught up in the presence of our Lord and so engulfed by the beauty of that divine and brilliant light where there will be no darkness, no questions, no puzzlements, no misunderstandings. We look forward to that day when all will be made plain when we will no longer be looking through a glass darkly, but then shall see face to face. Even so come, Lord Jesus, we pray.